Well, the safe return home yesterday of Expedition 43 Commander uh, Terry Burtz along with Flight Engineers Anton Schkapleroff and Samantha Cristoforetti after their stay aboard the station signaled the start of uh, Expedition 43. And uh, to get a preview of some of the highlights of the increment that has just started, uh, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Scott Stover here. Scott is the lead flight director for Expedition 43 and 44. So he's staying on for for another uh, increment through the <clears throat> Expedition 44. And um, Scott, welcome. I know you, you're very familiar with this room. You've worked right over there, but now you're kind of overseeing the team from the crow's nest and I guess representing this team to the outside mission management team and, and other entities within flight operations, right? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, as, as a flight director, you know, sitting here in this room, you, you're you in charge of the day-to-day, -day, what's going on, uh, answering crew calls, making sure the timeline is getting done. As an increment lead, what we do is we look, um, I often say I live a couple weeks in the future. We're always looking at what's coming up and making sure that the overall requirements and uh, big picture plans for the, the rest of the increment is, is getting uh, planned out and, and hopefully successfully completed. Um, you know, we always have hiccups here or there or if a piece of hardware doesn't work the way we want or something like that but our goal is to you know the the program NASA and the international partners all have requirements whether it's science experiments or adjusting the the space station's configuration or anything like that and we um, plan to to get that all accomplished as crew time is available to to do that you and I actually chatted yesterday afternoon uh, about this but um has there been any any significant impacts to the uh, schedule with the kind of the one month delay in the start of Expedition 44? I, I know we chatted about Expedition 43 staying a little longer. So I, I talk about the impacts, if there even are any, uh, for the expedition that just got underway. Yeah, so we, we've had to rearrange a few things. Um, the, the benefit of having the 41S crew stay longer was um, we did relocate the permanent multipurpose module. Uh, that had been planned to do later in the summer, uh, but with the additional crew time that was available uh, early in the increment, we were able to, to get that accomplished. Um, now, we do have here about six weeks where we're down to just three crew members on board. Uh, included in that will be the uh, SpaceX 7 uh, mission. Um, so one of the things that we're sort of constrained on is how much we can actually do with only three crew members on board. Right. Um, we're we're going to be pulled pretty tight uh, during that time frame, and we'll have to make up for it once we get back up to six crew. The, um, the, the planning team, your team, is also um, working toward... Uh, but potentially some spacewalks this summer. Uh, the dates are still, I guess, to be determined based on how the schedules fall out with the launches and everything. But um, these spacewalks actually constitute a pretty significant change to the uh, station in terms of its uh, outer mold line, which we call in the business, I guess. But give us an overview of of what that means when we get to that point. Yeah, specifically, uh, the one space, U.S. spacewalk that we're trying to, to get into the schedule right now uh, has to install the international docking uh, adapter. That that piece of equipment flies up on the SpaceX 7 mission, and uh, it enables uh, the actual first docking of a commercial uh, crew vehicle to the ISS. So. Um, it takes two crew members to go outside, and then also the help of the Canadian robotic arm and the uh, the uh, SPDM uh, to install this docking uh, adapter on the front, very front end of the ISS on on PMA2. Uh, once that gets installed, and then of course after our commercial uh, partners get uh, fully ready, um, ISS will be ready to accept a commercial crew vehicle. So we're we're very excited about having that capability brought on board. You also have. Um a number of visiting vehicles that are planned um, during during this increment, um, and and potentially one of those being relocated um, at some point after it arrived. What's the story there? So yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we have the SpaceX 7 mission coming up here in late July, uh, and uh, so w once that gets there, um, lots of science experiments coming up, lots of hardware coming up, and uh, including that international docking uh, adapter. Um, and we'll, the crew will be performing those experiments, trying to transfer all the cargo. Uh, and, and we have uh, Dragon stays on board for about 30 days. We might extend this one closer to, to 40 if uh, if we can, and uh, get 
get it loaded up with uh, important science samples and hardware to come home. Uh, and then later in August, um, the plan is to launch the uh, HTV uh, number five, uh, which is our JAXA, our Japanese transport vehicle. And um, that one will uh, initially berth to the nadir side or the bottom side of Node 2. That's where we put most of our cargo vehicles. Um, however, um, the, there's the possibility that the next SpaceX will be coming up right, right after that, and we may have to keep uh, HTV on board while SpaceX is there. So we may be moving um, uh, the HTV module to the Node 1 nadir. That's where the permanent uh, multipurpose module was just relocated from. And uh, that way we may actually have two uh, cargo vehicles there at the same time. Lots going on, um, and, and HTV is planned to stay beyond the end of increment 44 into the increment 45. Um, at the same time, we'll be Soyuz operations will be going on, progress operations will be going on. A very busy time, what uh, August and early September looks like. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of science that's going on related to the one-year mission, and, and that, those, that science keeps coming up, right? So, uh, as with the SpaceX flight. Correct, and, and and just because the crew members are on board, science keeps going. Um, you know, as you can imagine, a normal person has to go to the doctor once a year, or, or you may, you know, depending on your health uh, condition, need to go to the doctors more often. Well, to in order to get good science samples, uh, the crew members are scheduled at uh, regular intervals to have science samples taken. Uh, you talked about VO2 max earlier. That's one of the examples, and as you said, it's about once a month that that happens. So we have very flight day specific uh, samples and activities for the crew that monitors their health, and, and that's the data that the doctors are gathering to understand the impacts on the body. Um, one last question to touch on. Um, it's a busy agenda, obviously, especially with three people up there right now, but um, is it helpful having an experienced crew like this one up, up there? Oh yes, I, I would say it's it's definitely uh, beneficial to us. You, you know, if we launch uh, new crew members that have never flown in space before, um, we have to give them some ad adaptation uh, time. Uh, everybody is affected differently uh, to zero g. Uh, some some people it, it's like a fish returning to water. Other people it's the fish out of water kind of kind of thing where the the, it, the body just needs time to adjust. Um, you know, ISS is a very large complex where we store things. Everything like that can be confusing. If you have a crew member that's been there before, has served long duration there before, they sort of know it, right. and we don't have to give them all that adaptation time, and, and they know where things are and whatnot, so they, they come up to speed and can be plugged in really quickly. Great. Well, Scott, we appreciate you taking a few minutes to stop by. I know you're in this room all the time, and I'm glad I was able to snag you today uh, to uh, come by and talk about the increment a little bit. Yep, my pleasure.